thank you collective for calling me. Uh, part of my introduction should have been that I am from JNU. The second part of the introduction was that my introduction to Manipur was on this campus. Introduction to ethnic politics was also on this campus. Um, and I would like to straight away say that I understand absolutely from where you're coming and I have no disagreement with them. In fact, what I want to say is to build upon your arguments, if I may. Um, so let me try and build it in three parts. One part is a bit biographical, but maybe you will understand uh, from where the ethnic politics comes and the problems with it and not the problems of why it needed to be done or not done. Um, and since I have spent uh, many years, including that book, which is called Book Nali, which is on Naga National Movement, uh, is that why did I spend so many years uh, defending a uh, ethnic, well, today it's an ethnic movement, a religious movement, in fact. And what have I learned from it? I will come to that. But I want to give a little historical background because, as uh, Dr. Prem said, we are a university and we want to understand these things. And this is the best place for us to understand them. So I want to uh, tell any of you who are doing research and are wondering from where this ethnic politics came, uh, I want to read out, in fact, there was a book written in 1981 called Ethnic Explosion. I began my political life, as far as Northeast is concerned, with reading that book. It was written by Nirmal Nibedan. He wrote the first books on Northeast. He wrote this ethnic explosion. After that, he wrote on the Naga movement. After that, he wrote on the Mizor movement. I think those books are available in the library. But I think he warned us about what is the problems which will happen in the Northeast. And look, uh, I want to read out just that one paragraph. He, and this is in his preface. It is the ethnic explosion. Make no mistake about it. Have no doubts about it. World governments, more so India and Southeast Asian countries, will have to closely study the case of ethnic minorities, whether they are Kachins and Karens of Burma, the Mizos or the Ohoms of India. The ethnic minorities of India, particularly those of the Mongoloid stock, will deserve more attention. For gone are the days when small bands of proud tribesmen fought and defended themselves with poisonous ripped, tipped arrows. Today, in the 1980s, in the ethnic minorities are wielding sophisticated weapons, engaging national armies to combat unceasingly in belief in brief they are zealously guarding the ethnic identity it is going to be a long war for all the sides frighteningly effective and cripplingly expensive for both none may emerge victorious both may be losers this was said in 1981 and if you link this insight with what we just heard, you can see that from 80s to 90s to 2000, how has this ethnic warfare on all over, it's in Northeast, it's all over Africa, all over the world, why is that come up? So that's the first question that we need to think. I would give you one answer, historically, which I uh, can, I haven't brought the books, but I if you want to do it, is that in the 1980s, which is when I began human rights work, it was in the West Hello. that they started ah. saying that human rights violation, the major cause of human rights violations, is ethnicity. Not imperialism, not colonialism, not capitalism, not class, but ethnicity. So this word and this, its relationship to the human rights movement and women's movement and indigenous people's movement and environment movement all these movements emphasis on ethnicity comes from the 80s 
So for you and any of you wanting to do research, and you want, I would mostly, I'd love to tell you if you are interested, but it comes from there. So yes, it is a deliberate way of making the third world look at all problems in terms of ethnicity instead of class, instead of imperialism, instead of core capitalism. So that is the first thing that I want to say. So it isn't true that people weren't thinking about this. But where did this vision suddenly get lost? And that is the second part of what I want to say. That is, that why is the, whatever the analysis is correct, the question is, how do we fight? How do we fight this capital? And I'd like to give you one more example. In Kashmir, what happened? They took away 370, that is one part. But what actually has changed? I've got, I haven't got the figures here. I was supposed to chair between the Nazi and the Kuki. I was supposed to. No, I hadn't prepared the whole thing. Let me tell you. That all this was done in the name of Kashmiri Pandit. That they took away. But what happened? If you see the list, it is, I think, 20 acts or 14 acts all the good land which have been repealed or have been transformed. And who got the first big contract for land? It was the Emirates. It was Armani com com Company. Armani company. So it was neither the Kashmiri Muslims nor the Kashmiri Pandits. The huge big first foreign contract of the corporate was from the Emirates. Ethnic politics made sure that nobody objected because it's a Muslim country. Or maybe they did, I don't know. But I haven't seen any statement against this contract which has just been given a few months after. So yes, it is the corporates who will get the land. It is the corporates who will get it in Manipur. And actually, perhaps it's not been publicized with my husband and I. My husband is also from Manipur. I'm from JNU. So he and I, in fact, went to the parliament committee and objected to the changes in the land law, which were made, again, many years ago, and put it there, saying that the corporates are coming and these land laws and these changes are being made so that the corporates can go in. So it isn't true that we haven't thought of this. It's not true that we, nobody has thought of it. But the question is, how do you organize resistance? There are two parts to any uh, problem. One is analysis, understanding, and clarity. I understand from where he's saying the clarity, the problem with clarity, but I'm saying political clarity on what the problem is, the causes of it. Second is, what is the action we need to take? How are we to challenge this corporatization? And as he said, the corporates haven't come to Manipur. So even if we say it's for this, nobody is understanding it. And today, there is no space within Manipur to have a conversation. I did write an article, I had an interview with, for the first time in my life, I said, ethnic politics must stop. Now it's not because I believe in it. But I said this, and a lot of people in that room, see lots, uh, you know, 37,000 or 35,000 people have said, but very good. But who are the people who said it? Because they agree with who I'm blaming and who I'm not on the specific concept. There's, if even the people who say, yes, it's not right, are not understanding from where it's coming. So what is the way in Manipur to develop a new politics, a new understanding, new politics? How will the new alliances be made? Who will make them? And yes, everyone's demands for autonomy or, or the autonomy or, or separation or sovereignty or sometimes overlapping demands. So where is the space? There is no space. And that's a success. Not only is it the land laws are being changed and the, 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 it get, the capital is getting ready to, to invite these corporates, but the space for discussion and debate is no longer there. So the challenge is that those 
Dada's cookies make it pangal, whoever are outside the state must find the space to discuss these problems. Because I'm sure they cannot be done with you. And last time when I said one interview, one sentence on NDTV, my uh, effigy was burnt in uh, Manipur. Now, when it was effigy was burnt, my friend's daughter said, who is this in Sharvat Kutta? She said, this is Auntie Nandita. So the kids are also saying, Auntie Nandita, that will be burned. Those friends are still my friends. So we saw that there is space for discussion. But there is no cross -country. And we were very aware of it. In 1988, when I took up the case, Oyam case, I think for the first time, four lawyers from four different communities. We had another uh, temple. We had a cookie for, for the chin group. Uh, both have become judges subsequently. We had, uh, and we had me, which is the Mayang, which is the outsider, the basic one. All three of us worked together and we uh, did the case on a thing which should have united us, which is on human rights. And yet, human rights movement itself was ethnically divided and is still strong. So now the question and the challenge is how to bring a space where we can discuss safety and come to some kind of alternate politics and alternate to ethnic politics. That is the challenge before all of us. But now I like to say that all of us means all of us even from outside Manipur. Because what happens is that the Delhi people also act and think in ethnic politics. What do they say? Okay, we have a discussion. So we call one Naga, one Kuki, one Mete. Or we have, I, I have been to discussions where I was called for this book and they asked an Asimis author, she's a very good writer, but she knows nothing about Manipur. But the person who invited us from Goa, so his ethnic idea is he must call the local person and she will speak for Northeast. When she cannot speak for even her state because she doesn't know anything on the political paper, she's a very good writer. So even in Delhi and the Delhi people or the outside people have added to this ethnic way of looking at things or ethnic politics. And to get out of it is very difficult because we have interviews after interviews even now in only in terms of okay now we've got one Mete guy now or we've got one Kuki MLA now we should get one Mete MLA now we should get new numbers not involved in this sort of thing so you get like this so now what is the alternative I'm not giving an I and I have no answer to that in this thing but the one question I would like to ask all those communities is it why did you vote for a particular party? They all voted for that. Now they say that they don't want and they want to resign. But what was this for four more years? That why were they all voting for a particular party? And they must answer for it. They can't just say they resign and go. So if there's opportunism, there's no politics, you join a party which you oppose or you think there's certain things that you just join it for you know, for, for the sake of joining, or for power policy. I think they need to explain why they joined in the first place. Why have they become so powerful? You can't blame the political party once you put it in power. Or you have to show your criticism. There must be something called self-criticism. That why did you do it? So that is a question, which I think is very important. But now, having analyzed this, the issue that to me has been very important and for me which is very urgent from the point of view of what I do in my work and that is the issue of the Burbies coming in. What are the problems? There are two problems. One issue is what I thought and if any of you are interested it's there, it's called Nandita Akta versus Manipur, it's a case which I did. But the issue is there that there we have the worst army rule that you can possibly have. People are just being killed on the road. There are snipers who are taking shots and killing unarmed people. So that is the kind of situation. It's 
in one state. And there is no political vision with any of them. So in that situation, for those of us who study, in fact, I wrote that book, I'm not uh, advertising it, but I'm saying what the process by which I wrote, and that's an explanation or a confession to you that why did I do this? I came to Nagar, I came to jail you. It was a little of emergency, people were arrested, people, prisoners were being released. And in the midst of this, I suddenly found people from Nagar. I'd never met another in my life. All I knew about Nagar is that somewhere they're wanting independence. I was an international Pakistan, and I said, I don't want anything to do with these guys. But I found them, I was seduced by them. I was amazed at their politeness, their culture, their, their guitar, and of course the cuisine. And I fell oh. in love with all this. But I also realized that at that point of time, the Nagas in this university were making a Naga people's movement for human rights. I didn't realize that was the beginning of the human rights movement being divided on ethnic rights. Soon after that, there was a Sikh human rights group, Mizo human rights group, Barak Valley human rights group. And that was how the human rights groups got divided. But why? Because I was in few years, I became subsequently secretary also. But somewhere we were not adequately taking up the rights of those people living under Armed Forces Special Powers Act. And at that point of time, the Nagas had their own human rights. But at that point of time, they made alliances with the Students' Union and JNU. Even then, it was not this poisonous sign of ethnic politics. But it was beginning. I think if the Students' Union had been more interested, put in more energy, they could have changed this kind of ethnic politics. But that's a question for the history students and for all of us to ponder over. So these are the issues that I wanted to raise, and I think it would be nice if we have questions and a discussion. Thank you.